Good morning. Thank you, Chuck, for filling in last week. Uh, or I say filling in, leading last week. I, I really, I am so excited after hearing these guys preach, hearing the devotions they do every week. I am looking forward to really teaming up with them in uh, proclaiming the Word of God here. So it's, it's good. I mean, he made a lot of Jesus last week, right? I mean, I, I kept waiting for the phrase, but he, he didn't do it. But no, 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 man, spread that around. That's a, but uh, 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 it was, uh, when you look at these passages, and as Alan uh, referred to him today, there's just so much in this book of Acts. We, we get caught up in the birth of the church and, and our mission and all that, but we forget about being reminded in these, uh, these Israelites, these early uh, first believers, these early disciples of Christ, what they teach us about Jesus and who he is and how it impacted in how they live their lives. And so as we continue on, I hope that we don't miss those things. And, and you guys have done a great job of bringing it. I didn't wait till Saturday night, though. I listened to it a little bit earlier in the week. Um, I do want to say a word about next week. I really encourage you to come. Uh, we've got lots of different things going on. Pastor Dan and I are going to team preach. And I will tell you, you want to come for that. I, there's, it's going to be a little bit special. I, th- I, I think, well, listen to me. I think it'll be spe- Here's what I will say. You'll walk out of here going, hey, that was special. Or you're going to walk out of there and go, that was special. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can say that. So, but I think that you will, you will enjoy it. Let's turn to Acts chapter 4. I'm getting verse 23. And before I forget to, I, I have to do this because I know I'll forget to do it at the end. Uh, you know, I'm going to be in the office more. I, I probably will be in here at least sometime every day. Uh, really going to try to emphasize on Mondays and Tuesdays, being here a good bit of the day. But here's what I would say, just call. Yeah, I think you've got my information. Call, find out if you want to come by uh, or stop, you know, because I'm going to be in and out. Uh, but I'm, uh, we're going to really start being concentrated about getting together with folks uh, th- uh, through the rest of the summer, uh, but would love even during the day. Um, you know, you hear something in the sermon that you want to say, hey, let's, let's rethink that. You know, come by, buy me lunch, and we'll rethink it. <laughs> but, but seriously, I would just uh, would welcome the interaction, and, and I'm, we're going to be proactive, both April and I, in doing that as well. But I, I don't know, is that good enough to give it that kind of like flexibility? And, uh, but you have my number. Don't hesitate to call or reach out at any time. So to the uh, part at hand today, I, just, I was having a great reflection there during the um, Lord's Supper. And I just think God is so good. And I love how he pulls and brings things uh, together. And, uh, and the type of people that, uh, that we can be because of what Jesus has done for us. And I've titled this Confident Praying. And this comes on the heel of getting the uh, Extreme Prayer book a couple weeks ago and starting into that. And uh, I think prayer is, is the foundation of all that we do. It, I think it was well said. Uh, I don't, I, you know, you just got to call out one. Spurgeon Moody, one of those guys. <laughs> he said it was, it's the engine that drives the church. But I want you to hear it. He's not talking about the church necessarily in its mission, although that is a big part of it. It is the engine that drives us, the church. It's what keeps us connected to God. It's what draws us into a deeper, intimate relationship with him. It is what helps inform how we act, what we think, what we do, our values, uh, our, our opinions, all of those things. It, it really will drive every aspect of our life if we give ourselves uh, to spending time with him. And there really is no greater time than spending with him. Uh, it's just... It is truly that sweet relationship he's provided. So let's, let's look, take a look at what this idea of confident praying is this morning. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven and, er, and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. 
For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders and perform through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. Father, I pray that you'll bless the reading of your word. I pray that you'll bless the preaching of your word. I pray that we will have surrender hearts to hear what your spirit has to say to us. Lord, uh, give us the uh, surrender hearts, the submission to, to receive in our hearts, and then, Father, give us the courage and the confidence to go live it out boldly as these early disciples taught us uh, to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, last week we're at this point in the Scripture because uh, the disciples are still going about their uh, daily lives. They're uh, going to the temple, they're praying, they're sharing the Word of God, they're healing people, and uh, it's starting to create a um, conflict within the established um, uh, church of that day, which would have been the, you know, the uh, leaders of Israel. And they were feeling threatened by this because, well, I don't know about you, but you know, 3,000 people join your new church in one day. Uh, it tends to uh, get the uh, attention of some. And so these religious leaders bring uh, John, or Peter and John in, and I'm not going to re- preach uh, Chuck's message. I mean, no, I don't think I should. I, in fact, I would, I would horribly mess it up, I'm sure. But I just want to say that th- what they did was they brought him in, and they thought, they thought as if they could do this, Tell them, don't do it anymore. Don't do it anymore. Now, they understood the threats behind that and what would come. I mean, they just witnessed, prior to this, these same leaders having Jesus put to death, what Alan read to us this morning. And so I know that there was this part in them, but they stood firm, they stood bold, and they said, we can't help ourselves. Do to us what you will, but our faith is in somebody greater, and we have to tell about Jesus. It, do you ever get like that? We just have to tell somebody about it. Where we really experience is when we have things in our lives that happen that we know only God has done, and we can't wait. I remember when I was an early believer. I'm reading my Bible, man. I'm eating it up. I'm just taking it in. I got somebody discipling me. And I'm showing up at church. I was that annoying guy that would show up at church, and I would go to seasoned elders and leaders and say, did you know what it says in here? And they would all go, that's sweet. You know, he's reading the Bible, he's growing, he's learning, you know. And then part of me thought, why aren't they as excited about this as I am? And I pray to God that we never uh, lose that enthusiasm about reading about the things that God has done, our experiencing, our seeing God at work in our lives. May it always excite us, and may we always get excited when others come and tell us about what he's doing as well. Let's not lose that passion. Let's not let it just become a part of who we are, but let it really be lived out. You know, because what happens is we just, we go, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard it. Yeah, I know that, you know, and it becomes almost rote and mundane, and, 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 and we just, we forget the, the, the life these are the living words of god and he's alive and living in our lives and wanting to do great things and so uh for them to say we can't help ourselves i I pray that that's what we would become like we can't help ourselves when we have the opportunity we can't make ourselves you know I, i put this down i said what a difference pentecost makes right Actually, I was trying to do a play on that, what a difference a day makes, you know, what a difference a Pentecost makes is what I was going to say. And, and it is true. It is because of them being filled with the Spirit. I mean, think about Peter. Be prior to Jesus' death, and as Jesus was with them in that Last Supper, and he tells them, one of you is going to deny me, you know, and we go through that whole exchange, and Peter says, not me. You know, the bravado, you know, he was... He had the hubris. He was, he was all there. Uh, my uh, Hispanic friends said, machizo. He, you know, he was just full of it and, and, and living it out. And he said, I will never deny you. And Jesus looks at him. You guys know what he says. He says, tonight, before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. And Peter's like, eh, that's just not going to happen. Well, when the pressure came, Jesus was arrested. He was put on trial. And he saw what was going to happen. Peter did indeed flip his behavior. 
He went from this big bravado kind of person to someone who was fearful and shaken. And he said, I don't know who that is. I don't know who that is. Why do you keep telling me that I'm associated with him? I never knew the man, and he runs away. And he runs away in shame and guilt, but, you know, isn't it great the Lord comes back to him and restores him? And he reminds him, hey, look, you know, I told you this was going to happen, and it's okay, but here's now. What I want you to do is take all that you experienced, especially now that I'm here, ascend it, and giving you these things. Feed my sheep. Go love my people. And Peter does that. He does. He, he follows the words of the Lord. He goes and he, and he, he uh, becomes a part of this thing we call uh, Pentecost and, and living in up. Uh, he becomes one of those who stands against all odds. He stands in the fight. We used to get a weekly award in, uh, my, on my high school wrestling team called the Baguba Award. And it was based on your attitude, your behavior that week and overcoming certain uh, obstacles and things. It, it stood for brutally aggressive guy uninhibited by adversity. And it really that has served me well in my life, that little award. And, and uh, you know, I was honored. My team voted to give me the, at our annual banquet at the, after our senior year, or during our senior year uh, after the season, uh, the honorary Baguba Award for the year. And that was, I was in my battle with cancer uh, for the two of those years. And and stayed on the team and, and, and got a lot of support from them and encouragement, but uh, hopefully was an inspiration to them as well. And, you know, that's where I first started to see God at work, and it was great. Peter would not have gotten the Baguba Award on the night before <laughs> Jesus was crucified, but he would come to get it. He would learn what it would take. He would learn what it meant to stand against all odds and to stay in the fight. He, he learned the lessons of Noah, of Moses, David facing Goliath, Joseph, the list goes on, right? We have example after example after example. And, Ellen, as you said in your devotion, none of these guys were perfect. They all stumbled. They all made mistakes. But God continued to bring them back and raise them up and do incredible things. I love Hebrews 11. We talked about this before, I, I believe, but it is a great chapter to go and read whenever you're feeling kind of down and, and, and isolated and and feeling like, man, I, I don't know if I'm making any difference in the world at all. And is this faith thing really worth living out? Just go read Hebrews chapter 11. We call it the heroes of faith. Uh, I'm just going to read a portion of picking up verse 36. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. Wow, would that be said of us? They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised. They were approved before God because of their faith, even though they didn't see the impact that that would have in this life. And the reason was God had provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. And that's no small little piece there. I don't have time to unpack that. But we share these things, we witness these things, and we experience these things together because that is what makes it perfect. And that's what makes us a mighty fortress of the Lord. Peter and the early apostles after Pentecost learned this lesson. You know, what a difference the Holy Spirit makes when you surrender to Him. It, it is. It is. I mean, there's many people who go through their whole life and never really surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. I believe they're followers of Christ. They've trusted him, but they still can't seem to wrestle and get away from their own management of life, managing who they are, what they're doing, and not just allowing him to have complete control. I'm going to make mention of this later, but in this book that Wendy had introduced to us a couple weeks ago, uh, uh, Prayer extreme extreme prayer good grief it just went out of my head extreme prayer and uh we are going to have to we have to put ourselves into one we have to be disturbed enough <laughs> bothered enough by circumstances in our lives to put ourselves in a posture of submission unto him a posture of dependence is how 
uh, he says that the author says that a posture of dependence and we need to move there and that's what these early disciples did they learned to surrender to put themselves in a posture of dependence believing everything that he said everything that they taught him the early disciples stood firm and they were bold they moved from being fearful to being bold if they had any fear at all it was that they would allow the current circumstances to keep them from being bold in their faith and that's the record that we have today that's the thrust of their prayer They prayed, Master, you're the one who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, everything in it. You said, your Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our Father David, your servant. And they quote this prophecy from Psalm 2. Why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assemble against the Lord, against his Messiah. We don't often turn to Psalms for prophecies, but we found in over the last couple weeks, we found that that shows up there often. And the writer of the psalm is referring to, to the Messiah and and just saying the futility of this. They're going to try to come against you. They're going to try to come against you, your kingdom, your people, and it's it's just going to be futile. Uh, They are not complaining here. They see this simply as a reference reference to prophecy. They see and they, um, they understand that this prophecy has been fulfilled in Jesus, and so they don't turn and they don't quote this in this unifying prayer that they have. They're praying together. I don't want you to get the idea that they all, now, I, it could have happened, I guess, but our best understanding is it's not just that they all were so inspired that they all started praying openly and out loud the exact same words. More than likely, someone was leading them in this prayer and the thought and whatever everyone was praying, they were unified in it. They were praying the same things. That's what Luke's wanting us to catch is that no matter what the words that were being said, they were praying in this way. And it wasn't a complaint. It was something that, that was, um, that was an awareness. They were just praying. They were recognizing, you know, we know what happened to you, Jesus. We see this persecution now uh, growing and raising against us as the followers of you uh, by the religious, same religious leaders that put you to death. And so their prayer is simply saying, you told us, there would be days like this. I'm sorry, I couldn't let my old rock and roll you know, get away completely. But you told us there would be days like this. You told us that it would be persecution. In fact, if we're going to follow Christ, it says we have to suffer in his persecution. So they weren't complaining about it. They were acknowledging it. They were, they were letting Jesus know. They were letting God know we get it. We, we understand. They were not complaining, but they were voicing their belief and their trust in who Jesus is. They acknowledged the fulfilled prophecy, prophecy, excuse me, stating that in fact the city, in the city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate uh, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant Jesus whom you appointed to do whatever your hand and you had predestined to take place. You know, I I wish I wouldn't have reread that. That would sound like a jumbled uh, word salad there. Let me just say what they were saying is, hey, you know, we know, we, we take that prophecy, we heard what David wrote in that psalm, and we know that it refers to the Messiah, and we know that Messiah is you, Jesus, and we've seen it played out, that these people, the, the, your, your own rejected you, the Gentiles even came, and they were part of that, they were all part of this plan to put you to death, but we recognized it wasn't their plan, it was his plan. God, you predestined this. We know that you uh, planned for Jesus to go through this. I I think that they were acknowledging, so we know that you have this plan for us to go through it. And the things that we're going to suffer, the things that we're going to experience, the places we're going to go. And I don't think it would be a stretch at all to say they were praying the way Jesus taught them to pray. When you think about that beginning, you know, where they say, Master, you're the one who made heaven, earth, everything in it. They acknowledge this. You know, Jesus taught us to pray, our Father in heaven. Your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Your will be done. Your will be done as you have decided for it to be. They are praying, as your will is in heaven, let it be so done on earth. They acknowledge that what happened to Jesus was determined and, was, and happened because God determined it. And no earthly effort would thwart it. No futile act of any kings, of any people, anywhere will thwart his plan. Listen, that should encourage us. 
you guys have heard this, I'm sure, over the years. We know the end of the story, right? We win. Isn't God so gracious that he tells us how it's going to end? And I can get excited about that. And he says, now that you know the end, now live like you know the end. Live like you believe that you understand what the end is going to be like. That you're going to be my people in this new heaven, this new earth, and I'm going to be your God and you'll be among me and I will take care of all of your needs. They acknowledged that what happened to Jesus was determined because God determined it to happen to him. But they pray this, do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I believe this is the crux of their unified prayer in Acts 4. Because they come to this, they say, now Lord, they start to give their requests. They've acknowledged, they've had an awareness, they know the situation, they know what's taking place. But they come and they say, Lord, consider their threats and grant your servants may speak with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders and perform through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. We had some friends of ours over uh, Friday night, and we were playing cards. Are we allowed to play cards? I, I, I guess I should have asked that question. And we were playing cards, and, uh, uh, and we were playing Phase 10, if any of you know that. And, and uh, uh, this uh, friend of mine, he's a, a Presbyterian pastor in Napoleon, and um, he skipped me. And he goes, yeah, I got to do it to you, brother. I go, no, you don't. And I said, are you familiar with the word precatory? You guys know what precatory prayers are? These are the prayers of the psalm that's praying against the enemies, you know. And, and I oftentimes will do that. Whenever Ohio State plays Michigan, I'm praying a lot of precatory prayers against that state up north. But we, we, we use that term and we have a lot of fun with it. And we think if we're not careful, this is what's happening here. But it's not. Very much like when Peter uh, uh, shared with the, the uh, various times that he stood up and spoke to the crowds and saying, hey, this is what you've done. But I'm not just saying this to bring shame and guilt on you. What I'm doing is sharing this so that you understand who Jesus is and that despite you, that you did this to him, he welcomed you in. He wants you to become a part of the body of Christ. And that's what these disciples are praying now. They're saying, hey, Lord, consider their threats. They don't say, uh, get rid of the threats. They say, consider the threats. Grant us, your servants, to be able to stand firm in this, to be bold in this, not to give in to the persecution that they are now facing and they know it's going to grow and they're going to face even more. They know what is coming. But they have witnessed the work and miracles of Jesus. They have witnessed his death, his burial, his resurrection. They've experienced the giving of the promise of the helper sent from Jesus, the Holy Spirit. They have, continued, they have witnessed the continuing work of Jesus after his ascension by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that exciting? They got to see it. We still see it today in, his, uh, in the work of the Holy Spirit through the early disciples. And the early disciples did not want to lose what they were witnessing and experiencing. They didn't want to lose it. You remember when you first gave your life to Christ? I mean, I was 17 years old. I was radically changed. And I knew that I, would, I, would do, I did not ever want to lose that. Now, we have ups and downs. And we go through some valleys and we go through some desert times. But the one we always return to is Christ. And that's where we find. And we should want to grow in that. We would, should want to grow in seeing God work and move in our lives and the lives around us, in, in, in our communities, in our, uh, certainly here within this congregation, but then in the places where we live, we work, where we recreate. We want to see God move. The key for these early disciples, for them to stay connected and submitted to Jesus despite any persecution, is from Greg Pruitt. If I looked a little further in my notes, I'd have remembered every one of them. He states in the introduction in his, his book, Extreme Prayer, that we need to learn to pray from a posture of dependence. Yeah, it goes, I, we're celebrating the 4th of July, right? The Independence Day. I hope you don't miss that. Because that's what we've grown on. And that's what we've grown to become, is very independent. And it's, it's all about who? Me. And we've got to find a way to surrender that, even though the culture speaks hard against it, that we have to be completely surrendered and submitted to Jesus Christ. N.T. Wright provides a good summary, I think, of what these early disciples had in this posture of dependence. He says, with the ground thus prepared, the main triple thrust of the prayer, and he's talking about the prayer of the early disciples here we just read, is straightforward. 
He says, they pray, not Lord, please cause them to die horribly. That would be those precatory prayers, right? Or please stop being so unpleasant. Not Lord, let this persecution stop, which I found interesting because I know people and I have many conversations with those in persecuted areas where we, we start to pray for the persecution they end, they say, no, don't do that. We're afraid that if we uh, don't have that persecution, it will cause us to be further moved from the Lord. And so for them to be strong in these places, in, in places that we're not even allowed to mention the names of the missionaries there, we pray that they just stand firm and bold and stay connected to the Father. He goes on to say, uh, N.T. Wright, please convert the authorities so that your work can go forward. They didn't pray that. Now, would they have wanted that? That's what they're doing. That's why they're doing it. And so we need to continue uh, to pray for it. But that wasn't their thrust. Rather, their thrust was quite simply, now, Lord, look on their threats and let us go on speaking boldly and will you please continue to work powerfully. This is what the early disciples were praying. Not that any of this would go away, not that these people would die, not that horrible things would happen. They were praying that they would stand firm and they would continue to be bold in their faith. No matter what. And some of these people are the people we read about in Hebrews 11 and the things that they experienced. He goes on to say, when they had prayed, the place where they assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. This is not a second Pentecost. I mean, the Spirit's already come. But there was this recognition that the Spirit was there. And God gave them a sign uh, of, of their prayers being answered. He shook the place. He shook the place. When we pray in a posture of dependence, we need to expect God to move. We may not have a building-shaking event, but let's say we did. If we're praying that way and unified and know, we would know that the building is shaking because the Lord is the one shaking it. That's the kind of faith and trust that gets built in us. I think of an old story. I'm sure you guys have heard this over the years, but it's told. I, who knows if it's true or not, but you know, the parable is the parable, right? But it was about a church uh, in, the, in, in the region where they were living, was having a drought. It was starting to become severe, affecting the farmers' crops, everything, everybody's livelihood. So they said, Pastor, we need to have a, uh, a prayer meeting. We need to pray for uh, this drought to end. We need to pray that God would send rain. And so they set a time. They all showed up at the church, and they came in, and the pastor stood up before him. He says, well, we just need to go home. They were like, no, we're here to pray, to pray for the drought to end. He says, there's no sense in us praying if you're not going to believe in your prayers. If you're not going to believe in what God can do in this, there's no need for us to pray. We just want you to go home. The stunned parishioners looked at him, what, what are you talking about? That's why we're here. That's why we ask you to do this. We, we want to pray. He said, but none of you brought an umbrella. Silly story, right? But with a very a poignant uh, teaching for us. We need to pray expectantly. Now, that's not to say that whatever we pray for, because we could have prayed for rain, it might not have still got rain. But what we're going to do is learn that we're going to pray, not my will, but yours be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying. I like those two words, but God. And I also like these two words, so that. So that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can pray and we can have the confidence that even though the prayers don't get answered the way that we want them answered, we will have the assurance that when we pray, we can stand firm and bold, knowing that because of our posture of belief, because of our trust, because of our surrender, and our dependence in and on Jesus, it will result in the will of God being carried out on earth as he has established it in heaven. And what that will do is give us the confidence to go on and face whatever adversity comes our way. We become bakubas, brutally aggressive Christians, uninhibited by adversities. I see a t-shirt coming. Bakubas. Wright gives us this challenge. He says, the church needs to learn in every generation what it means to pray with confidence. We do not go looking for persecution, but when it comes in whatever form, it certainly concentrates the mind, sends us back to the scriptures, and it casts us on God's mercy and power. The church needs again and again 
that sense of God's powerful presence, shaking us up, blowing away the cobwebs, filling us with the Spirit, and giving us that same boldness. And I would just say today, the challenge for us, may we be a church who prays in confidence that results in us standing firm and living boldly for Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the truth of it. Lord, I I just pray that that your scripture will inspire us, that it will change us, that it will move us, and it will help us to be people who are faithful, even in the face of the greatest adversities of life. Lord, may we live lives that are truly an honor and blessing unto you. May we be a church, Father, that when we meet, we do sense and feel that shaking because of the spirit that is present among us. And Lord, that carries us then to go and be your ambassadors in this world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.